And now, brothers and sisters, I invite you to open your Bibles to, uh, and I w- it is my custom to look at first the Old Testament, then the New. I'm going to read scriptures to you, first from Psalm 32, as we prepare to hear God's Word preached. I want to demonstrate to you from the Old Testament how that the message of the gospel, something you know well, I don't need to remind you of it, but that just it's, I think it's always good to see, to connect the dots between the Old and New Testaments. And here in Psalm 32, we have this doctrine of justification that the Apostle Paul lays out for us so beautifully in Romans. We have it here, even in the Old Testament. Just a few verses. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. And then we'll turn to Romans 8, where we find our sermon text. First then, Romans, uh, Psalm 32, beginning at verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and who, in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my groans grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Salah. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Salah. Now we turn over to Romans 8, and here we find our sermon text for this morning. While you're turning, I'll mention to you that we'll have somewhat bookend sermons today, God willing, Romans 8, 1 through 4 in the morning, and Romans 8, 26 through 30 in the evening. So now for context, we're going to read begin reading at 7.20, Romans 7.20, but remember our text is 1 through 4 of 8. Romans 7.20, now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Amen. That's God's word for God's people. We ask for him now in prayer to open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to his word. Father, now we ask that you would illuminate our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that we may have ears to hear your word and that you may give us the grace to act upon it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, I have no doubt that you have heard a sermon or two on Romans 8, 1 through 4 over the years. It is a favorite passage, a favorite chapter of many Christians all over the world and a favorite passage for pastors to preach upon, especially as we think about the Reformation in this time of year and we think about that doctrine by Luther said by which the church stands or falls, justification by grace alone through faith alone. Secondly, as we move through this season of the year in the fall, there are many, the stores, as you probably have noticed, are already gearing up for Christmas, and Christians all over the world are going to be engaged in various celebrations of the incarnation of our Savior. The text reminds us, 
that of many things, but one thing it reminds us of is that the law, spoken of in, uh, in, a, in full in chapter 6 and 7, that the law of God in all its glory and goodness was weak and was unable to accomplish our redemption. It was weak in the flesh, but nonetheless God, by sending His own Son in the incarnation in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, condemned sin in the flesh, dealt with sin once and for all, as the book of Hebrews reminds us so wonderfully and often. This text then in 1 through 4 reminds us of that doctrine we confess in the Apostles' Creed, we believe in the forgiveness of sins. To bring that point to a head and to illustrate it for you, imagine that you were in a courtroom and you were called in to answer charges against you for the sins of your entire lifetime. Imagine that what the verdict would be against you. Would you be condemned? Would you be pronounced guilty? Would you be set free? Or would you be sentenced? And what if after the verdict and the sentence, an enemy walked into that courtroom and offered to take your guilt and your punishment upon himself so that you could go free? What if that enemy, of course we know this is a fanciful illustration, what if that enemy obeyed every single law his entire life? kept every commandment of God and man perfectly. Like that fanciful scene, the Holy Spirit here through the Apostle is taking us into God's courtroom. The doctrine of justification has to do with jurisprudence, divine jurisprudence, divine justice. As we look at the context, and we read a little bit of it in Romans 7, in the context, we saw, especially at the end of chapter 7, that Christians, on the one hand, like Paul the Apostle, serve God's law, and on the other hand, are handicapped by our sinful nature our whole life long. So that evil is always present with us, even though in our hearts and minds we delight in the law of God by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. Christians... In verses 23 and 24 of 7, long for deliverance from this war, this conflict, this struggle, and even this captivity. But because of the Trinity's work, we have in verse 25 this wonderful promise in an exclamation from the apostle that Christians, in fact, will be delivered from this body of death. And that brings us to our text, verses 1 through 4. Those in Christ Jesus and the law. What is the relationship between those in Christ Jesus and the law of God? As you know, the answer to that question is many, manifold, and varied all over the Christian world. And even in our own state, even in our own county. What do the scriptures say? That's what we want to know today. And you have the answers there in your outline. I hope you were able to get one in your bulletin there. Four things. First, we are declared, Christians that is, are declared legally not guilty in God's courtroom. Second, we are set free from the old law of sin and death. Third, Christ did what the law could not do. And fourth, therefore, in Christ we have a new relationship to the law that is to, compared to what we, that relationship B.C., before Christ. Let's look at those one at a time. Those in Christ Jesus and the law of God. First of all, we are declared, according to Romans 8, 1, legally not guilty. It could not be any plainer. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You'll see the word therefore in some of your Bibles beginning verse 1. And the language, is, and you may notice also in many of your Bibles that the words 
there is, or in italics, those are not there in the original, begins with a conclusion, then or therefore, as a res- it's proclaiming to us a result or a conclusion. That's why when I read it, I just moved right from 7 to 8 without pausing because, of course, first of all, there weren't any chapter divisions when the scriptures were written in the first century. And secondly, to show you that flow of thought and argument, the apostle moves from a despairing cry in, in chapter at the end of 7 and then an exclamation of thanksgiving to God for what he has done to say, as a result of this, this uh, what God has done, yes, yes, pointing back to chapter 7, the struggle with sin is real, the struggle with sin is brutal, but thanks be to God, says the apostle by inspiration, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we Christians are delivered from this body of death. So that with our minds now we serve the law of God. Therefore then, there is no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. In God's courtroom, no condemnation whatsoever. This is that doctrine that was so precious to the reformers. And so precious to God's people even down to this day. That we are delivered Because we are delivered by Christ, there is no condemnation. Now, this Greek word has in one word everything that I laid out in my illustration. It has in this one word, condemnation, the verdict, the sentence, and the penalty. All three things that you would see in a courtroom setting. That is to say, there is no damnatory sentence from the judge of all the earth for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Trinity, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the judge, the jury, and the executioner. But by His grace, for those in Christ Jesus, there is no guilty verdict from that jury. There is no punishment from the executioner. Those of you who are in Christ, there is no gallows, there is no stoning, there is no crucifixion for you personally. This is not a universal promise. There is a very important condition, isn't there? This is a promise for those who are, you see it there, don't you? In Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus. We often talk about our union with Christ and our communion with Christ and even the Lord's Supper makes that evident to us today. Let's flesh that out. Though it is certainly, as my seminary professor used to say, bringing coals to Newcastle, I never really knew what that reference was, but the idea is bringing something to you elementary that you know so well as being mature Christians, most many of you. But let's, it's okay to go back to the basics now and then. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? We have to go back to what we were out of Christ Jesus. You and I deserve the curse of the law because of our sins. But Jesus, of course, as you know, became a curse for us as we read in Galatians 3. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. For you in Christ Jesus, brothers and sisters, the verdict was passed down to be sure, but the verdict fell on him. He was pronounced guilty as your substitute in your place. For you in Christ Jesus, he as your substitute suffered the equivalent of an eternity in hell that you and I deserved. For you in Christ Jesus, the substitutionary atonement has been made. For you in Christ Jesus, he suffered in your place, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not because of his own sin, as you know, but because of this weight of your sin and mine and the sins of all his people from Adam till the present. 
that fell upon his shoulders. And so therefore, in Christ Jesus, since all of that is true, you need not fear the law, Christian. You are not subject to the eternal condemnation of the law of God in Christ Jesus. Because by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, He is your substitute, your Redeemer, your Savior, your Lord. He suffered the penalty of the law so that you do not have to. But as we were praying earlier, we don't know. We never are 100% sure because we can't see into hearts. And sometimes we have guests. We don't know if there is perhaps one sinner friend here who is still under the condemnation under God's law, who is not yet this day in Christ Jesus. If there is such a one, as long as you refuse to repent of your sins, as long as you refuse to believe what has just been said, that in the work, person and work of Jesus Christ as the only substitute for the sins of humanity, then you are not in Christ Jesus as long as you refuse to repent and believe. You have no substitute. It's just you and God in that courtroom. And what a fearful thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God. That's the bad news. But the good news of the gospel is that if God gives you the grace to repent of your sins, to confess your sins to Him, to be brokenhearted about your sins, to be willing to turn from them with His grace, by His grace, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your substitute who took your place on that cross, who took your sin upon Himself and paid the penalty in your place, then there is hope for you too. There is a not guilty verdict for you as well. So that verse 1 can be your promise too. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now the verse does not end there though, does it? Verse 1. It goes on to say, Those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We need to be very careful here. This is not placing a condition on God's declaration (coughs) of no condemnation. There's no condition here. He does not say, if you don't walk according to the flesh, then there is no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. Or, if you walk according to the Spirit, then there is no condemnation for you. There's no if-then clause here. There's no condition. The apostle is simply stating a fact. Or to put it another way, this is not an imperative. It is an indicative. It's a statement of fact. The fact is that those who are declared righteous do not walk according to the flesh. They walk according to the Spirit. But let's flesh that out because that that phraseology can be greatly and has been throughout church history greatly misunderstood. That is to say that by the power of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel, you and I, brothers and sisters, have been regenerated, born again. The Spirit of God has given us life. He has empowered us to begin walking according to His leading, to walk in the Spirit. B.C., before Christ, we walked according to the flesh. That was our world. That's the world that we lived in. That was our milieu. That was our environment. That was our modus operandi, to walk according to the flesh. But now in Christ Jesus, we no longer walk according to the flesh, which is not to say, not to deny Romans 7. Romans 7 still holds. There is a struggle to be sure. But we are empowered to walk in the Spirit. We are different than what we used to be. In Romans 6 and Romans 7, especially Romans 6, the apostle had laid out previously that we have been set free from the guilt of of sin and free from the complete domination of sin. 
that we once experienced in our flesh before conversion. Before Christ, the flesh led you. Before Christ, the flesh guided you. Before Christ, the flesh dominated you. But now, in Christ Jesus, it is the Holy Spirit that has made you free from the guilt of sin, free from its power to completely dominate you and rule over you as it did before. And that is the sense in which we walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. To put it another way, justification is always joined to sanctification. These are twins as, as if they were Siamese twins that cannot be separated. They're always together in the Scriptures. And the church errs when she tries to pull these two apart somehow. Calvin in his Institutes said this about this joining this inseparable nature of these two works of God, justification and sanctification. I quote, As Christ cannot be divided, so also these two blessings which we receive together in Him are also inseparable. End quote. As much as we relish the doctrine of justification and rejoice in our Reformed heritage in in joining Luther in bringing that to, to the fore in, the, in his day. We, we are saddened about the fact that he did not proceed to flesh out the doctrine of sanctification. That came later with other reformers, both on the continent and in Great Britain. These two are inseparable, and that's what the apostle is doing here. He is in this passage reminding us, yes, of our justification, but also the fact that justification cannot and must not ever be separated from sanctification. And so, to conclude this first point, as we think about this wonderful status that we have in Christ Jesus, in his courtroom, the verdict comes down, not guilty, not because we in ourselves are not guilty, but we are declared not guilty. We are counted as righteous because of our substitute. That's the first thing. Declared not guilty. Those in Christ Jesus and the law, the first thing, by God's sovereign grace in Christ, we are declared not guilty. Secondly, we are set free from the law of sin and death. You can see how verse 2 now picks up on what was just stated and fleshes out what was stated there, that we're not walking according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For, says the apostle, let me explain this as it were, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What does the apostle mean by this Law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Well, let's unpack this one step at a time. First of all, the Holy Spirit we just read about. We're reading about the work of the Holy Spirit, aren't we now? The Holy Spirit is the giver of spiritual life. He is the one who regenerates us. He applies the work of Christ to us. And the election of God the Father comes to... Uh, ha- take place in real time in the sense of our regeneration, making us alive in Christ. William Hendrickson, in his commentary, a Reformed commentator from some decades back, wrote, quote, The law of the spirit of life means the forceful and effective operation of the Holy Spirit in the hearts and lives of of God's children. The effective and forceful operation of the Holy Spirit in the hearts and lives of God's children. End quote. That's what's meant by this law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We might think of it by illustration of some, another law that we know and we're very familiar with. Will Those of us who are over 60, when we go to stand up, will recognize this law right away, the law of gravity is trying to keep us in our seats. 
But it is a forceful law, isn't it? We feel it pressing us down. In a similar way, the law of the Spirit of life is a forceful action of the Holy Spirit that has certain effects on the justified sinner. The Spirit of life is in Christ Jesus because the Holy Spirit gives life because of what Jesus accomplished, namely the atonement. You know this very well from a passage of Romans chapter 6 that you probably memorized even early in your life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But now remember the last part of it, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the apostles begin to flesh out this idea of double imputation. That on the one hand, our sin is imputed to Christ, credited to his account. His righteousness is imputed to us, credited to our account, Christian. And so we have, we confess, we believe in the forgiveness of sins. The Holy Spirit, Christian, has made you free from the law of sin and death. You have by his grace been set free to serve God without your former constraints. Not perfectly, that day is coming. It's not here yet. Closer for some of us than others. Only God knows. One day we will serve Him without any constraints. But the, what, listen carefully, what I'm saying is the Scripture is teaching us that we are set free to serve God without our former constraints. In our, in our life before Christ, Sin dominated us. We could do nothing but serve the law of sin. We could do nothing but walk in the flesh. But now the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from that total domination. So that Romans 7 now becomes a reality for us. This struggle. There is a want to. There is a desire to fight against sin that God has put in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the spirit of life. In Christ Jesus. He's made us free from the law of sin and death. We are set free from the total domination we experienced before Christ by our three enemies. The world totally dominated us, the flesh totally dominated, the devil totally dominated us before Christ, before the Holy Spirit regenerated us and gave us life in Christ Jesus. But we've been set free from that total domination. Yes, we have been set free, but not free to do anything we want. That's anarchy. That's antinomianism. That's something the scriptures and we reject out of hand. But we have been set free by the law of the spirit of life, and that's our sanctification. Our minds have been renewed. Our wills have been renewed. Our emotions have been renewed. Our desires have been renewed. That is to say we have been given abilities in Christ Jesus that we never possessed while we were enslaved by sin. And so the hymn writer in number 650 rightly says, I will sing of my Redeemer. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and what? Made me free. That's the second thing. What is the relationship between the law and those in Christ Jesus? One, we've been declared not guilty. Second, we've been set free from the law of sin and death. That's, that, that is its total domination. And third, Christ did what the law could not do. Pardon me. Christ did <coughs> what the law could not do. We have visible holy signs and seals set before us to underscore that very thing. That's because the law was weak, verse 3. The law was weak. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. The law could not and cannot change our sinful nature. The law only has power to condemn. The law has no power to convert, to change the heart. 
But the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the work of all three persons of the Godhead are laid out here masterfully in verses 1 through 4. That Trinity, that triune God, did what the law could not do. God, the one having sent his own son in similarity of sinful flesh, and because of sin, he passed sentence upon the sin in the flesh. What did the Father, what the Father and the Son did? Notice the shift now from the work of the Holy Spirit in our sanctification back to the work of of the Father and the Son in our redemption and our justification. What the Father and the Son did is the basis... What the Father and the Son did is the basis of our freedom in Christ. You see the connection between the verses. Freedom in verse 2. What's the basis of that freedom? What the Father and the Son did. Think of... You could let your eye drop down to verse 32, looking ahead. And we have this summed up so well there. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And again in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Each one of these verses in summation form sums up the work of the Father and the Son. Or that famous verse we know so well, John three sixteen. God so loved the world that what? He gave his only begotten Son. He sent his own Son to accomplish what the law could never do and that's highlighted so well in Philippians 2 7 but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming how in the likeness of men you see how that is held out to our mind's eye here that God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh in Christ's flesh In his human nature, the Father condemned and he punished the sins of his people. Our sins, brothers and sisters. He must take on flesh in order to die that atoning death as the Lamb of God. Notice the language, though, in the likeness of sinful flesh, not in sinful flesh. We read of him of our Lord and Savior, that he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. He was condemned. We read, sent his own son in the similarity of sinful flesh because of sin's curse, because of its power to condemn us, because of the sentence passed upon us by our own sins, He sent his son in the flesh to condemn sin. And that word condemn means to give a sentence against. He passed sentence upon sin in the death of his son, in the flesh of his own well-beloved son. He caused his well-beloved son to descend into hell, to use the language of the Apostles' Creed, for you and for me, experiencing hell on Calvary's cross as God's wrath is poured out upon his well-beloved son, his wrath against your sin and mine. No wonder he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Vine's expository dictionary gives a great comment, I think, on Romans 8, 3 this way. I quote, God's condemnation of sin is set forth in that Christ, his own son, sent by him to partake of human nature, sin apart, and to become an offering for sin, died under the judgment due to our sin. End quote. That's the gospel in a nutshell, isn't it? That God 
must condemn sin. He is a holy and righteous and just God. He must deal with sin. He must punish sin. And so he sends his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to partake of human nature and to become the Lamb of God, to become the atoning offering for sin, to die under the judgment that was due to you and to me, Christian. And so we consider again as we come to the table of the Lord the price paid for your guilt and mine, for your corruption and mine. He sent his only beloved son into this sinful world to take on weak human flesh and blood in order to become our substitute Christian. He took on himself my condemnation and yours, my sin and yours. 2 Corinthians 5, the apostle says it so beautifully. He made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Let us not let a day go by without thanking Him for it. That's the third thing. Christ did what the law could not do. That brings us to the fourth thing. This new relationship to the law We've seen what our old relationship to the law was. It, hang, it hung over us like a guillotine, ready to drop at any moment and send us into hell under the wrath of God. But now through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have, in, by God's grace in Christ, a new relationship to the law in order that a righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. What is the righteous requirement of the law? We read it today, didn't we? To sum it up, Jesus says to the rich young ruler, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's the righteous requirement of the law. And no one has ever or will ever even come close to carrying that out, even for a 24-hour period, let alone for a lifetime. But if that's the case, what does the apostle mean? That the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. It doesn't seem so. I just read Romans 7, and it seems that the apostle is saying, I'm trying really hard. I I love the Lord. I love his law. But I find when I want to do what is good, I find myself not doing it. When I don't want to do something, I find myself doing that. How then can he say that the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us? That word fulfilled means to make complete or to cause to happen. Matthew Henry helps us. He says it this way, Both in our justification and in our sanctification, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled. He's going to say more momentarily. But think of it again about that doctrine of imputation, that the righteousness of Christ is credited to your account, Christian. And that, the, that because of that imputation, the, satis, the, the ju- Father's justice is perfectly satisfied in your case. Go back to the courtroom. That's justification. But in sanctification, the Holy Spirit begins to write the law of God on our hearts so that we begin to hate the things that we used to love and love the things we used to hate. Our catechism says... Ask the question, can those who are converted to God keep these commandments perfectly? You can already surmise the answer. No. But it goes on. Even the holiest men, in the, while in this life, have only a small beginning of such obedience. Yet, so, that with earnest purpose, they begin to live, not only according to some, but according to all the commandments of God. There is a change by God's Sovereign grace in our sanctification. And so I'm finishing up Henry's thought. Then he goes on to say, Though the righteousness of the law is not fulfilled by us, blessed be God, it is fulfilled in us. Let me say that again. Though the righteousness of the law is not fulfilled by us, yet blessed be God, it is fulfilled in us. Look at verse 4. It is fulfilled in us 
again, this phraseology, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The fact that we now, by God's sovereign grace, begin to walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. We're not dominated by that flesh anymore. Now the Holy Spirit is at work in our hearts, causing us to to begin, to use the language of our catechism, to live according to the commandments of God. Begin. A small beginning. The holiest men in this life only have a small beginning, but it's a beginning. That's the change. That's how the law is fulfilled in us. This is that doctrine of progressive sanctification. Another one of our catechism questions, I'll have two more for you. It's always good for you to teach us, the Westminster, and us to teach you, the Heidelberg. We, by the way, I was born and I was raised on the Westminster standards when I was a teenager, so I know them very well. But the catech- our catechism says, what is this dying of the old man? What is this change? What is this sanctification? Heartfelt sorrow for sin, causing us to hate and turn from it always, but listen to the language, more and more. That's progressive sanctification, isn't it? What's the making alive of the new man? Heartfelt joy in God through Christ, causing us to take delight in living according to the will of God in all good works. Again, more and more as the decades go by. Hendrickson again. Out of gratitude for and in response to the outpouring of God's love, we now love God and our neighbor, end quote. That is to say, the Spirit of God in our sanctification produces fruit in us, to use the language of John 15, Jesus' own words. He's the vine, we're the branches, and we bring forth fruit by His power and Spirit at work in us. And in that way, the law is fulfilled in us as we walk in the Spirit. Paul will say more as you move through Romans to about not walking in the flesh, but his point here is that Christians are no longer dominated or controlled by our sinful nature the way we were before regeneration, before the Holy Spirit breathed new life into us. One more quote from Hendrickson. Now the law of God serves as a guideline for expressing our thanks to God for his deliverance from its curse and penalty. And so... Here's what we've seen. What is the relationship between the law and those in Christ Jesus? First of all, we are declared by God's grace not guilty before his bar of justice. Because of the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. Because of the work of our substitute. Secondly, we are set free from the law of sin and death. Not 100%, not in the sense of sinlessness, but in the sense of no more domination by sin or death the way it used to be third christ did what the law could not the law was weak it was powerless to convert it was powerless to justify or sanctify christ did what the law could not do and then fourthly therefore we now have a new relationship to the law by god's grace as a way to express our gratitude and our thankfulness for what he's done. And we'll do that now in the Lord's Supper.